Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Church at Bart for this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen, and I'll be leading the service this evening, and Gareth will be sharing the message later on. So we're going to start firstly with announcements. Hopefully you all picked up, as you picked up your order of service, inside you'll see there's uh, some information about what's happening in the week ahead. And just a few things I want to highlight with you. Um, particularly next Saturday morning for the men in the, in the uh, gathering here, there is a breakfast uh, next Saturday from 8 to 9.30. Looks like a, a really interesting time that you uh, will have the opportunity to hear stories from Reverend Dan Evers and Dr Neil Miller about the work of prison chaplaincy and uh, the Kairos ministry. So please uh, take that opportunity if you're able to, to attend. There is a request for an RSVP to Jerry Williams and the phone number's there in the bulletin for you. Uh, communion is going to be held in a few weeks' time in the morning service and it'll be at Belconnen and Western Creek next Sunday morning. And tickets are still on sale for the uh, 90th birthday. And if you'd like to buy tickets for that, uh, please see Gareth after the service. And of course, offerings are, um, the tin is in the foyer. And this morning there was an issue with the electronic payment. I don't know if that's fixed this evening or not. Oh, it's not fixed yet. Okay, so you might have to put in double next week if you're going to pay electronically. Okay, now as we come to our service this evening, I wonder why, if you've ever thought about why we worship. There are lots of passages in the Bible that talk about worship. And I just thought I'd highlight one in particular, Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11. It says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So we worship God to respond to who he is, because he is the creator of the universe. He's marvellous and he's magnificent, beyond our description and our understanding. He loves each one of us more than we can ever know or understand. He has good plans for each one of us. He sent his only son, Jesus, to be our saviour. And all of that definitely deserves our worship. So as we begin our service this evening, our first song reminds us that worship is not about us. It's about God. So let's stand together and sing, Here I Am to Worship, reflecting on God's love and sacrifice.
Let's come before God now in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you created us in love to enjoy your presence in your creation. You made us in your image so that we would find purpose and possibility in our lives. In Jesus, you show us how to share grace and peace with one another. As we spend time this evening in worship, I pray that you would recharge us so that we may leave here with a deeper sense of who you are as we offer ourselves to you through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Heavenly Father, you created us to enjoy your presence, yet we confess it's easy to lose track of that joy. You know the details of our lives. You see the sin and sorrow we bear. You see how we take advantage of each other, how we fail to look out for the needs of others. We confess, dear Heavenly Father, we don't see all that you see in our own lives and in the lives that touch ours. Thank you, Lord, that you keep no record of the wrong things that we do when we ask for your forgiveness. Open our eyes to the truth of our time and cleanse our hearts with your grace as we strive to live lives that bring you all the honour and glory. Amen. might have run away from you. Are your children here, Jackson? Are you here, Jackson? <laughs> this is putting pressure on them, isn't it? But it's easy. Now, I'm going to do something very quickly. Would you like to answer questions or run around and make you run around use the microphone and have other people answer questions? They're they're easy questions. Do you want to answer them or be a microphone? You answer them. Okay. I've got to remember what the questions are. So all the questions are on you. But it's very brief. Did you watch the Olympic Games? Any part of it? A bit of it. Excellent. Did anybody here not watch some part of the Olympic Games? Ooh, some people didn't. Well, that's going to... Anyway, we'll work, move on from that. What was your, what's your favourite competition in the Olympic Games? There's not a right or wrong answer. The kayaking. The kayaking. Oh, excellent. What's the, what's the sport... You don't want to watch it all. The boxing. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Women's boxing. Yeah. Oh, we've got to vote for women's <laughs> boxing. Okay. So uh, a lot of the questions I ask now are supper questions. You can have your Olympic conversations over supper. So favourite competition, least favourite. Um, so up here we've got the Olympic symbols. And when we look at the Olympic symbols... We actually learn a bit. Do you know what the Olympic, what, why there are that many? Why there's five? That's okay. Do you know why they're that colour? Don't know is okay. Does anybody know why there's five? Go, check, go, yeah, go, Colin. Yeah, the continent. And you're right, yes. And why those colours? Oh, can you show me it was the continents? Why those colours? Yep. <laughs> okay. The reason they are those colours, the colours are in the Olympic rings, 
is because when they first started the Olympics, they worked out that those five colours would include a colour from every flag in the world. So every flag in the world will have at least one of those colours. And you see, that's part of the reason why I like the Olympics, because they come around every four years, so that's sort of special, and there's some of the places it's been to in the last four years, but it's a whole joining together of a whole lot of things. It's a joining together, as Colin said, of all the people from all the continents. And I think it's quite wonderful that they, the countries of the world send their best athlete in a sport to compete against the best in the world. Their athlete might not be the best in the world, but it's the best from their country in that sport and then they compete against each other. I like the idea that a whole lot of different things come together in the Olympics. There's the tradition of the torch and the tradition of the opening and closing ceremony and there's the rings, but then there's also the competition. And you can watch people perform and compete at such a high level. Tonight's service is a little bit like the Olympics. Not much, just a little bit. Where it's going to be a whole lot of different things coming together to hopefully teach us something. So, you did really well with answering the question. That's it, no more pressure. But as we listen tonight, if you see in the bulletin, not the, the order of service, there's, there's spaces. Now, the adults can write notes in there, but you might want to draw a picture. I'm going to tell four stories during the service, and you might want to draw a picture, either here at church or when you go home, of each of those stories to remind you what it talks about. Thank you. Well done. Something else is going to happen. So, with that, Avril is going to start our mixture of things in this service and I'll explain that a little bit in a, in a, after Avril but she's going to start with our first reading. The first reading is from Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So tonight's service is a bit different. In that, I'm hoping the message, the teaching, what God wants us to know tonight is going to come to us through the rhythm of hearing God's word, hearing a story, my small elaboration on that story, and then a song. And then we will repeat that rhythm four times through the service. So... That's what we're going to do. It's a shame these are in the wrong order now. There we go. So, the verse that Avril just read for us, Hebrews 12, verse 1, we are challenged to run with endurance the race that's set before us. But it's not a running race. Now, when I read run with endurance, I think of marathons. I think of fun runs and I think of the Olympics. But I know you'll find this hard to understand, but I'm not an athlete. I'm not a runner. And when it comes to these events, I'm a very talented couch potato. But I love to watch the marathons and the Olympics to see the best athletes of the world come together as one for maybe just a few weeks, but they come together as one to compete against each other. 
So tonight I'd like to share with you four passages from the Bible which challenge and encourage us how to live for Christ. The stories of four athletes who are some of the most famous athletes in history, but not for their success, but for the examples they brought to the world stage and who I believe have much to teach and encourage you and I tonight. As we look at these passages and these athletes and reflect on the teaching behind each one, I'm confident, I pray, that God will speak to your lives. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're here tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we can hear your word being read. We thank you, Lord, that we can spend time together in worship. And we pray now, Lord, that you will open our hearts and open our minds that we will hear you speaking into our hearts and minds to challenge us, encourage us and inspire us to be the people that you wanted us to be. Lord, speak to us now in your son's name. Amen. So Hebrews 12 verse 2, which... uh, was the second part of what was just read to us, encourages us to look to Jesus who with joy looked beyond even the pain and the shame of the cross to his goal of sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus lived his life completely focused on the will of God the Father. And that reminded me of the story of a rifle shooter, Matt Edmonds from the USA, who competed in the 50-metre rifle... Oh, over the page. Yep, that makes sense. 50-metre rifle position event. This is the marathon event for rifle shooting. You see, they have 40 shots in the prone position, that is lying on the ground, 40 shots at a target, 40 shots in the kneeling position, and then 40 shots in the standing positions. 120 shots that take about two hours to complete, where the bullseye is 50 metres away and is probably the size of your little fingernail inside a target. Now, in the 2004 Summer Olympics, Matt Edmonds was in first place going into the last round. He was just one clear shot away from winning the gold medal. He didn't even need a bullseye to win. He simply needed to hit anywhere on the target. On his final shot, he levelled his rifle. Bit of a complicated rifle, but he levelled his rifle He took aim, he squeezed the trigger and he watched the bullet pierce the centre of the target. A perfect shot. The only problem was as that he had fired at the wrong target. Standing in lane two, he had fired at the target in lane three. His score for a good shot at the wrong target, zero. He lost the gold medal, He came eighth. He had lost focus and fixed his eyes on the wrong place. Later, Matt Edmonds, when he was interviewed, said, I was just focusing on staying calm. I wish I had been more concerned with where I was shooting. It's an unfortunate mistake. It was an Olympic gold medal. But consider the tragedy it is when this occurs in our lives, that someone might dedicate their life to something, probably something good, and even achieve it, only to find out that they'd been aiming at the wrong thing. I'm sure we know many people who live very, very good lives, achieve good things, if not great things, but their lives miss knowing Jesus. When we put our trust in Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we are to fix our eyes on him 
Now, day by day, we need to carefully consider whether we're still aiming at the right target in our lives. Fixing our eyes on Jesus each day, we are to run to that goal, run to that finish. Fixing our eyes on Jesus is a moment-by-moment task. Using God's word, prayer through worship and being with God's people allow us to have our eyes fixed on Jesus so that we can live our lives for him the way he wants us to live them. Matt Edmonds need, needed to focus on each of the 120 targets to win a medal. Matt Edmonds lost focus for a moment and he lost a gold medal. We will never achieve all that God has for us if we lose focus. Matt Edmonds lost focus and the gold was lost. If we lose focus, we won't miss a medal, but we will miss being the people God wants us to be. But friends, you and I, I've checked it out, we're not perfect. We do lose focus from time to time. We make mistakes. We sin. But whenever that happens, we just need to seek his forgiveness, the forgiveness of Jesus, and refocus again. Our musicians and singers are going to come forward as we sing, Rejoice, Christ is in you.
Good evening. This reading is Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Now, living for God is not for the faint-hearted. Maybe you have heard the story of John Stephen Akawari, the Tasman the Tasmanian, the Tanzanian, the Tanzanian marathon runner who competed in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City and was the last of 75 competitors to finish the marathon, but is probably one of the most famous marathon runners ever. But let's start at the beginning. It was one of the hottest Sunday afternoons of Mexico City where the marathon, men's marathon was to start at 3 p.m. And of course, uh, Mexico City is high altitude, so that made it more difficult. Out of the 75 participants in the marathon, 18 would not finish the race. In the early parts of the race, John Akawari cramped up due to the high altitude of Mexico City. Somewhere around 19 kilometres, the Tanzanian was jockeying for position between runners and he was hit. Taking a terrible fall, he whacked his head, damaged his knee and was trampled before he could get back up on his feet. Injured, Akawari pressed on and continued despite being asked by the medical staff to quit. With a badly cut knee and a dislocated joint, bruised, bloodied and in great pain, he continued running, slowly but with courage and great determination. Long after everyone else had finished the race and after the presentation of the medals to the winners of the marathon, at around 7pm in that evening as it was getting dark, he entered the stadium to run his last lap and to finish the marathon. In obvious pain and hobbled, he hobbled towards the finish line. The Tanzanian found the last of his endurance to step up the pace and to run the last part of it. The small crowd compared to the full stadium of earlier that had remained rose to their feet cheering and applauding him to the finish line. And later, when he was recovered and treated, when he was interviewed, the interviewer said, why didn't you quit? John Akawari gave a simple but powerful answer. He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to Mexico City to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. Brothers and sisters, we have been called by God, saved by Jesus in what he did on the cross and saved and sent with his gospel, not to start in the Christian race, but to finish the race. At times, we are buffeted by others we have may, may be knocked down by the experiences of life and our pace may be slowed, but we continue on. But we have not been called to start the Christian race. We've been called to finish the race. Unlike the Olympic athletes, we are not representing our country. We are running for the King of Kings. We're his representatives. 
In Ephesians 5.20a we read, Therefore we, therefore you, are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through you and me. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's very own possession, that you and me may proclaim the excellencies of our King of Kings, who has called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. We are to run with courage and great determination for we are called by God himself and sent by God himself as his representatives to finish each Christian race that he has set before you. Friends, wherever you're at today, if you've wandered off the track a bit, if you're fallen, if you are hurting badly, whether it's your own fault or others have knocked you around, if circumstances just seems to be dealing you a rubbish hand, let John Akawathis encourage you. Finish the race, walking or running, stumbling or limping, it doesn't matter. Finish the race, run the race, day by day with Jesus. Now, Akawari competed for many years after the 1968 Olympics. He finished first in the African Marathon Championships. Every race he started, he was determined to finish, no matter where he was placed. As children of God, individually and collectively, we are called to run our best for God through the good times and the bad times so that our families, our friends, our neighbours, our colleagues and strangers alike will know that we are children of God. May we live each and every day to love and serve God until our Christian race is done and we collapse in the hands of Jesus. Whatever you do, wherever you go, know that you shall mount up with wings like eagles and not be weary, for the Lord shall renew your strength. Let's sing. We're going to sing the song On Eagle's Wings, which does remind us of our longing to be close to God and our deep desire to be in God's presence. So let's stand together and sing on eagle's wings.
This reading is from 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20. Then David said to Solomon, his son, Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Thank you, Avril. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 states that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who endured the cross. Jesus, in, in his life, focused on the finish line, which was to do his Father's will and to be with his heavenly Father. But knowing along the way, he knew that he would have to endure the cross of Calvary, where he would die for our sins, be raised again, conquering sin and death for us. Jesus never lost sight of that finish line, and we are to fix our eyes on him. Which brings me to my third story of dubious success, that of Derek Redman. Derek Redman was a 400 metre sprinter for the Great Britain at the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. He was in good form for the Barcelona Olympics, posting the fastest time for the first round and he went on to win his quarter-final. He was the favourite to win. In the semi-final, Redman started well, but in the back straight, about 250 metres from the finish line, his hamstrings snapped. It tore. He hobbled to a halt and then he collapsed on the ground in his lane in intense pain. Stretcher bearers were making their way over to him, but Derek Redman knew he had to cross that finish line. So he got up. The rest of the racers had already crossed the line, but he got up and he began to hobble along the track, grabbing his pained hamstring as he went. He was in agony, and although the finish line was just 150 metres away, he struggled to get there. Meanwhile, in the grandstand, a man was coming down the stands, barging past the security guards and running onto the track. Joining Derek on the track was Jim Redman, his father. Placing his hands on his son's shoulder, Jim told Derek that he didn't have to finish, to which Derek responded, I have to finish. And the response from his father, then we will do this together. Jim and Derek completed the race together, with Derek leaning on his father's shoulders for support. As they crossed the finish line, the crowd of 65,000 spectators rose to give Derek a standing ovation. Derek, of course, was officially disqualified because you can't have anyone touch you in a race. And after that race, was, he was told by a surgeon he would never run again. He would never represent his country in any sport. But that's not the end of this story. With the encouragement of his father, he applied himself to other sports and went on to play professional basketball served as Director of Development for Sprints and Hurdles for the United Kingdom Athletics Association. He won Celebrity Gladiators, whatever that might be, and is currently, or was, a motivational speaker on the conference circuit. And his father carried the Olympic torch at the London Olympics. 1 Chronicles 28.20, as just was read to us, tells us to be strong and courageous and not to be afraid or dismayed for the Lord God is with us. He will not leave us or forsake you. You until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Jim 
would not leave other way around. Let's get that the right way around. Yes, Jim would not leave Derek's side until together they crossed that finish line. He wasn't just going to cheer his son on, he was going to be there with his son every step to the end. Being a child of God can be, I'm sure you know, hard. But we need not to be afraid or dismayed for our Lord, our Heavenly Father, has promised that he will be with us until all the work of his service is finished. Jim Redmond put his arm around his son and told him they would finish the race together. Derek struggled to the finish line, but he made it leaning on his father. Friends, God's arm is around you today and every day. He will not leave you or forsake you until all that he wants you to do is finished. And just as God is with us, let us stand by each other. As God's children, as his family, I challenge you to live, love and work together in sharing God's love and the forgiveness offered as a gift through Jesus to all who would accept it. As we reflect on that Bible passage, as we reflect on that story, let's sing. Our next song, Be Bold, Be Strong, encourages us to trust in God and walk in faith and reminds us that our fear and doubt have no power over us when we have the Lord with us. As we sing this song, you may remember there is an echo. So Carolyn is going to do, sing the lead part and we'd like this side of the room to sing along with Carolyn and I'm going to sing the echo and I'd love this side of the room to echo with me. This reading is Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in, G in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Colin. As we just read, brothers and sisters, we haven't got to that finish line yet, but forgetting what lies behind us as we need to strain forward to what lies ahead, 
where to press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's my paraphrase of what's on the screen. But did you catch that? Paul says that we are to press on to reach the goal because Christ Jesus has called us. There's a paradox here. How can we run towards Christ as the prize if he has already claimed us as his own prize? Doesn't this mean the running is already over? And in a sense it does. As once you have given your life to Christ, you have been found for eternity, saved for eternity. Your salvation in Christ is secure. His spirit lives within you. These things are set forever. But in response to those realities, you now live to know Christ even better in your life, not to mention in the next. So it is your relationship with Christ, before you do any seeking, before you run the race to know him better, be convinced of this, as a Christian, Jesus Christ has claimed you as his prize and he'll never let you go and now in the light of this truth we're to strive for Christ as our prize as we strive to get to know him better. It's hard to escape the reality that we live in a broken world and for us as runners pursuing the goal of knowing Christ it often feels like we're limping towards that finish line. Which brings me, you've got it, to my fourth and final story. I'd like to tell you the story of Bill Broadhurst, not the man on the screen. See, because I think it describes how all of us feel at times in this race. In July 1980, 81, Bill Broadhurst entered the Omaha-Nebraska Nebraska, 10-kilometre Nebraska, race. But Bill Broadhurst is slowed by a brain aneurysm he suffered 10 years earlier, which had left him partially paralysed on the left side of his body. He made it his goal to finish this 10-kilometre race despite this obstacle, despite this disability. And he was determined to run because his hero, Bill Rogers, a world-famous runner, was racing that day. And you'd be not surprised to find that as much as I searched, I could not find a photo of Bill Broadhurst. His story is well known, but not photos. You see, Bill Rogers, that great runner that he is, came first in the race in less than 30 minutes. It would take Bill Broadhurst much longer. One hour in, his partially paralysed left side started to feel like a dead weight as he threw it forward, pivoted on on that leg and stepped forward with his right. And he continued to hobble or run, whatever you say, that way, throwing his left leg forward, bringing his right leg up to it. After two hours, the cars were back in the streets and getting through intersections became difficult. At two hours and 20 minutes, the pain was so intense and throbbing, he didn't think he could go on. But then he saw the finish line. But as soon as he saw it, his heart sank. The banners were gone. Everyone had left. But still, having come this far, he decided to push on to the end. And as he approached the finish line, he saw a small gathering of people off to the side. Then they moved out to greet him. And Bill Broadhurst, who'd suffered and struggled through that race, was greeted by... Bill Rogers, at the front of the crowd. They were waiting for him. As Broadhurst crossed the finish line, Rogers opened his arms and hugged him. Rogers then took the gold medal from around his neck 
and put it around the neck of the last runner to cross the line. You're the winner, man, he said. You take the gold. What a beautiful picture of our life with Christ. Jesus, the first runner of this race, as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, has not forgotten us, the struggling runners that we are. No, Jesus has taken hold of us. He is making us fit for the race and he is cheering us on toward the goal as well as waiting for us to give us the prize that we have earned, good and faithful servants. And so, let us not forget him. Let us fix our eyes on him, author, perfecter of our faith, and keep running this race of life in an unhindered pursuit of knowing Jesus better and knowing him more deeply day by day. The 2024 Olympics are over. We wait for the 2024 Paralympics and then I wait for the Commonwealth Games and the Tour de France and the Olympics in four years because they're all coming. But the 2024 Olympics is over as are all the Olympics which have gone before, but we are all living our lives day by day for Christ, day by day looking to love God, love our neighbours, share the gospel and live with and for Christ. I encourage and challenge each of you tonight to take the order of service and during this week to read and reflect on those four Bible passages and to prayerfully consider how God wants you to live for him with purpose and perseverance in partnership with him as you strive towards the prize of knowing Jesus better and better till you meet him forever. And as you study those verses through the week, maybe those stories will help you remember as you live day by day as God's forgiven, trusting, obedient children. Remember John Akawatha, the Tanzanian marathon runner, who would not give up, but would be courageous and be determined to do God's will. Remember Matt Edmonds, the rifle shooter who lost his concentration for a moment, but you keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Remember Derek Redman and his father Jim who finished the line together and you work together knowing that God is with you to be your strength and has given us each other to journey in the Christian life together. And remember Bill Broadhurst who crossed the line last and was given the medal by the winner because Jesus Christ has won the victory for you and for me and now Jesus cheers us on to the very end. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. We're going to sing about... Uh, some of our forefathers and the faith that they had as they lived their life. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. Let's all stand and sing by faith. By faith we see the hand of God.
Father, we give you thanks and praise and glory that you sent Jesus to die for us so that we may become sons and daughters of God. We pray as written in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, to first of all offer petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Give all leaders your mind and surround them with godly counselors. Help all leaders to esteem you and not dismiss you. As it is written in Malachi 4, 6, we ask that the hearts of the parents be turned to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents so that you do not come and strike the land with total destruction. Strengthen our own families and those closest to us, Lord. Help us to love and forgive others. Grant us your grace to make a difference in our world. We pray for the lost, the hurting, the lonely, the sick, the bereaved, and those who are imprisoned behind visible and invisible walls. Please send your comfort, your peace, your calming presence to those who are without hope. Protect the defenseless and hold them close to your heart. We pray for laborers to tell the good news of Jesus to people around our world. We pray for persecuted believers. Grant them the courage and your powerful protection. Find the power of Satan and strengthen believers everywhere. We hold in your presence all those who are being cared for in this parish and thank you for the care and dedication of those caring for them. We name before you all with particular needs who have asked for our prayers. May they know your presence with them and that you are their strength, their healing, and their salvation. Thank you, Jesus, that you are adequate for every need. Your name is powerful and your power is great. We pray these prayers in your mighty name. Amen. And as we conclude our service this evening, what else can we do but go in the strength of the Lord? So let's stand together and sing. I'll go in the strength of the Lord. I'll go in the strength. 
each and every one of you to stay for supper and to share with each other your Olympic stories, good or bad, your life journey and the race that you are running for God. But friends, go from here to run the race that God has set before you, to run that race with purpose, with per perseverance, in partnership with each other and with God our Father and run towards the prize of knowing Jesus better. And I pray all this in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night. God bless.